Hi guys, welcome back. Today I am here with my November wrap up. Because of Thanksgiving and traveling, I am a little bit late filming this. but I have a lot of really great books to talk about today. If you are new to my wrap-ups, the way that I do this is I start by talking about my stats for the month, then I talk about all of the books that I read, starting with my DNFs, or books that I did not finish, my lowest rated books, moving up to my highest rated books. 13 of these books I talked about in detail in my mid-month wrap-up. Those were books that I read in the first half of the month. So if you want to hear my thoughts on those, I am going to link my mid-month wrap-up up above. In this video, I won't be going into detail on those books because I already discussed them there. I'm just going to be mentioning the name and the star rating. In the month of November, I read a total of 24 books for a total of 9,283 pages. And that page count does include my audiobooks. I am definitely happy with that. Obviously, I did read more books in the first half of the month than I did in the second half of the month, but I read a lot of really fantastic books this month. And then with the holidays at the end of the month, I didn't finish quite as many, but um, this is great. This month I DNF'd two books and 18 of the books that I read this month were either advanced reader copies or books that were sent to me for review. Again, like last month, we're kind of getting closer to the end of the year, so these numbers are trending higher than usual as I'm trying to kind of get through things that I have left on my plate. In terms of the goals that I set for myself at the beginning of this year, I did read at least one indie published book. I in fact read two, one that was self-published and one from a small indie press. I also read one nonfiction book. It is nonfiction November and I intended to read more. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to finish the other main nonfiction book that I'm getting through. It's taking me longer to get through than I anticipated, but I am enjoying it and hope to finish that one in December. And no one is surprised, I did not read any translated fiction this month. In November, I read one graphic novel. I did not have any rereads. I read seven library books and I listened to 11 audiobooks. So in terms of audiobook statistics, this month all 11 of those audiobooks were books that I termed shelf, which means that I owned physical copies on my TBR shelf and by listening to them got them off of the TBR shelf in that way. Normally this number is not quite so high. I think this partly has to do with the fact that I'm trying to get through review copies and get to some of my backlist arcs and other things that I've just been wanting to listen to for a while. In terms of where those audiobooks are coming from, this month seven of them were from my library, two of them were from Scribd, two of them were from the Penguin Random House Volumes app as audio advanced reader copies, and none of them this month were from Audible. Moving on, let's talk about the age breakdown. In November, 11 of the books that I read were targeted at an adult audience, 11 of them were targeted at a YA audience, and two of them were targeted at a middle grade audience. Again, this is exactly on point with what I'm looking to see with about a 50-50 split between adult and YA, and a little bit of middle grade sometimes thrown in for good measure. Okay, next let's talk about genre breakdown. Unsurprisingly, my top genre of the month was fantasy. Is anyone surprised? Probably not. This month I read 11 fantasy books, 4 romance, 2 historical fiction, 2 literary fiction, 2 mystery, 1 nonfiction, 1 paranormal, and 1 sci-fi. And in terms of star ratings, this was an interesting month. I did not have any one star reads. I had one one and a half star read, one two star read, one two and a half star read, one three star read, three three and a half star reads, seven four star reads, no four and a half star reads. That is unusual. I don't know when that happened. I didn't give it any four and a half stars out, which is kind of odd this month. Nine books got five stars and one book this month got six stars and in my personal rating scale a six star rating means that it is a favorite of the year or a favorite of all time. In this case I am happy to say it is definitely a new all-time favorite which is super exciting. All right with that said let's go ahead and talk about the books. First up I DNF'd two books this month or chose not to finish them and I do talk about both of these books in my mid-month wrap-up. They are Not the Girl You Marry by Andy J. Christopher. I also DNF'd Queen of the Conquered by Kaysen Callender. Um, this one was really disappointing. I wanted to love this, but sadly it was not for me. 
The book that I gave one and a half stars to, I do talk about in my mid-month wrap-up. That is The Monstromologist by Rick Yancey. If you want to hear my thoughts on this book, go ahead and check out that video. Moving on, I had one book that I gave two stars this month, and that was an e-arc of Deadly Little Secrets by Jennifer Lynn Barnes. This is the follow-up to Little White Lies, which I read last year and really enjoyed it. I think I gave Little White Lies four stars last year. Um, sadly, this one just did not do it for me for several reasons. Little White Lies I thought was fun. It's a mystery set in the American South with these debutantes and lots of scandalous secrets beneath the surface. Unfortunately this one definitely lost me. In this case there were three different timelines which I found to be overkill and really confusing especially in the past timeline. Um, I normally don't have too much trouble keeping track of a large cast of characters but for some reason in this case I kept mixing up who the characters in the past timeline were. I don't think she did a great job of signposting who they are and why they matter and why we should care about them. They were the parents of some of the characters of our main modern day timeline and I just had such a hard time keeping track of all of them and I didn't really think that the multiple timeline thing added much to the story. It was just too much and it was a little bit all over the place. All of that might have given this like a two and a half to three star rating. However, when we got near the end of it, the twists and turns just got to be so over the top and so ridiculous. I just could not with this. When we get to the point that I need like a serial killer style diagram just to explain all of the different weird connections and scandals and parents of who's a parent of who and possible incest and all these like weird over-the-top bizarre things that happened at the end. I was like, no, nah, you've lost me. This is just too much. I can't do it. I ended up giving this one two stars. Next, I had one book that I gave two and a half stars to, and that was The Heartwood Box by Anne Aguirre. This is another one that I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up. So again, if you want to hear why I gave this one two and a half stars, go ahead and check out that video. Um, this was an arc that I won in a giveaway from Tortine. I will say with this, your mileage may vary depending on the tropes you like, but this really just didn't work for me. Then I had one book that I gave three stars to. Again, this is one you're going to find in my mid-month wrap-up, and this is my one nonfiction book and graphic novel of the month. This is Open Borders, The Science and Ethics of Immigration by Brian Kaplan and Zach Wienersmith. Then I had three books that I gave three and a half stars, and apparently I talked about all three of them in my mid-month wrap-up. So I guess we're going to be talking a lot more about four and five star reads in this video. The first one that I gave three and a half stars to was Blackwing by Ed McDonald. I also gave three and a half stars to Say No to the Duke by Eloisa James. This is a historical romance. And finally I gave three and a half stars to The Deep by River Solomon. This was an e-arc from NetGalley. Moving on, let's talk about my four star reads. There were seven of them, and four of them are books that I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up. The ones that I talked about in that video include Find Me Their Bones by Sarah Wolf, Strange Waters, a anthology of short speculative fiction by nine indie authors edited by E.B. Dawson, Get a Life Chloe Brown by Talia Hibbert, and finally The Guinevere Deception by Kirsten White. All four of those I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up. Moving on, let's discuss the three that I did not talk about in that video. First up, I gave four stars to a book that completes a trilogy that I've been working on reading for a while. This is The Winner's Kiss by Marie Rutkowski. So I finally finished this trilogy in pretty quick succession because I'm planning on reading the first book in her new duology next month. It's coming out in 2020. It's set in the same world. Um, and I'm really excited to read it. So this was an interesting series for me. In some ways, I wish that I had known how much it focused on sort of war and military stuff before I picked it up. For some reason, with the way that people talk about it, I assume that this was much more heavily a fantasy romance. And while it does have that, Baby. You got a cheese stick. Yum. Mama. What? I want to get ready. You want to sit with me? Yeah. Okay. Somebody is ready for bed. Yeah. Okay. You need a cheese stick? I have a reindeer to join me for a little bit. I don't know how much of them you can see, but so I kind of wish that I had known that this focused so much, at least in the later two books, on like intrigue and battle and stuff like that. Uh, because I think I kind of went in expecting it to be much more heavily a romance and the first book is I think the first book is probably my favorite of the trilogy 
But then the rest of it is partly this super, super slow burn romance between these characters, but mixed in with like a lot of strategy and battle scenes and different things. Um, and it's well done. Like I don't have a lot of complaints per se. I like the heroine. I think she's smart and it's interesting. Sometimes it dragged a little bit for me. Um, overall, I would probably give the series four stars. I liked it. It's not a new favorite, but I am glad that I read it. I also gave four stars to a middle grade book. This is Tristan Strong Punches a Hole in the Sky by Kwame Mbalia. This is one of the newer books in the Rick Riordan Presents imprint. Are you talking? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I think you gotta go. Brush your teeth, Mr. Mister. Oh, no, I'm not a Mr. Mister. You're not a Mr. Mister. No, I Jojo. You're a Jojo? Yeah. I okay, Jojo. Well, I think you gotta go brush your teeth. Okay? Say bye, people. Bye, people. See you later. <laughs> okay, here, take this. Bye. Bye. <laughs> So this is one of the newer books in the Rick Riordan Presents imprint. I kind of love that this exists. All of the books in this imprint are bringing marginalized authors to tell stories within their own voices mythology. And this book draws from West African mythology and African American mythology. And it follows a young boy from Chicago and includes mythical figures like John Henry, Br'er Rabbit and Anansi the Spider, among others. So in a lot of ways, I think that this book is really smart and really well done. It's definitely action packed. There's a lot of adventure. It's interesting because there's also a lot of symbolism involved that kind of draws on the African American history of slavery and oppression. For example, there's a type of monster in the world that this boy falls into called Fetterlings. You can see them here. They're basically like, you know, chains and sort of the big bads at the end of this have to do with enslavement and greed. So obviously there's a lot of symbolism here, but it still doesn't focus too heavily on that and manages to maintain a pretty light tone throughout the book. I just think with this that I am not necessarily the right audience for it, which is fine. This was not a book that was written for me. Um, this was written for a middle grade audience and it solidly feels that way. There were things that I thought were funny. I think most of it was well executed. In terms of my personal enjoyment, I would probably give this more like a three or three and a half star, but given the way that it's executed for the audience that it is intended for, I ended up giving it four stars because I do think there's a lot to love here. And I think a lot of middle grade readers will really enjoy this and see themselves represented here. So yeah, definitely recommend it if you were looking for something with that kind of mythology for a younger reader. And the final book that I gave four stars to is a YA historical fiction called Across the Broken Shore by Amy Trueblood. So this book is set in 1930s San Francisco and follows a young woman who is Irish Catholic whose family is set on her becoming a nun, but she secretly dreams of becoming a physician and getting into medicine. And so when a serious accident with her brother puts her in contact with a female physician who offers her a job as her assistant, she decides to lie to her parents and take this and has to decide the path that she wants to take for her life. There was a lot that I really enjoyed about this. I will say that especially in the early part of the book, the dialogue sometimes felt a little bit stilted with historical facts kind of pushed in there more than was necessary. But by the end of it, I was really rooting for the main character and I thought that the ending was really strong and well executed. I also think that this is a book that does a good job of being historically accurate, but also being relevant to modern concerns. It really gets at things like poverty and privilege and sexism and religion and the complicated nuances of the ways that some of those things can intertwine. And I think that's pretty well handled. I will say that there's gonna be some content warnings that you may wanna check out. I do have an in-depth review with a lot of content warnings for it in there. And it does tackle some more sensitive content as well, including the issue of abortion. I thought it was handled in a way that was sensitive and nuanced, but some people might be a little bit uncomfortable with that depending on their feelings with it. 
But overall, I really liked this. I think this is a really well executed YA historical fiction that's part coming of age story with a little bit of a romance plot. Um, that's really about a girl finding herself and learning to find her voice and stand up for herself, but also has a lot of other rich thematic content woven into it. So if that's something that sounds interesting to you, I would recommend checking it out. Moving on, we're going to talk about my five star reads. And honestly, I think this is where a lot of this video is going to be happening because I had nine five star reads this month and only two of them are books that I talked about in my mid month wrap up. So it was a really great second half of the month. The two books that I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up are The Bromance Book Club by Lissa K. Adams and Girls of Paper and Fire by Natasha Nyen. I also gave five stars to The Princess Plan by Julia London. I really enjoyed this book. It is a historical romance with a mystery subplot to it. Honestly, I don't feel like the cover is a super accurate depiction of what the book is about. But I really, really enjoyed this. I thought it was a whole lot of fun. It was definitely the kind of romance that tends to be more up my alley. It follows a woman who is a spinster. She's in her late 20s. And so she kind of doesn't care so much what society thinks anymore. And she runs along with her sister and best friend, a women's gossip paper. And so she goes to this ball partly to get fodder for this gossip paper and ends up meeting the prince of a foreign nation who is very self-involved, is not used to anybody telling him no, um, and they kind of have an interesting interaction or a couple of interesting interactions and end up working together to try to solve a murder mystery. And I just really enjoyed this. I tend to like these sorts of things where you have stuck up royals or privileged people coming into contact with regular normal people who kind of put them in their place. I find it to be really entertaining. This also has a lot of pretty great political intrigue involved in it, which I enjoyed and has an interesting mystery plot. So yeah, this was just a lot of fun. I think I was kind of sick when I read this and it was exactly the comfort read that I needed. So five stars to this one. It came out in November and is available now if you guys are interested. This was an arc that was sent to me for review by Harlequin. I also gave five stars to a book that is a little bit controversial. It is a critically acclaimed book, but it does certainly have some problematic elements to it and some things that I think can and should be criticized. Uh, that said, I also kind of loved it for a lot of reasons. So this is The Goldfinch by Donna Tart. Um, this is a tome. It is almost 800 pages long. It is a very in-depth character study with a little bit of a mystery plot to it, and it is literary fiction that won the Pulitzer Prize. It follows a young boy from the time that he is like 12 or 13 and loses his mother in a terrorist attack all the way up through adulthood. Um, now, some people just don't like this because it is very long and very slow and they think that it is boring because it is quite detailed in the descriptions. I, as some of you may know if you've been watching this for a while, do tend to love that. And in this case, that really worked for me. One thing that I will say, which is a criticism and a valid criticism that I have seen with this, is that there are a lot of very racist character descriptions in this book. I completely understand why some people just don't want to deal with that and have DNF'd it because of that. That is for sure something that is in here. I will say that with this sort of book, it is sometimes a little bit difficult to suss out what is coming from the author and what is coming from the characters. But regardless, I think that some of the descriptions at least are for sure racist. Others I think are a little bit more gray. Other things that you may find in this are things like some fat phobia. There is homophobia, although I would say that that is more something internalized by characters rather than something that I feel like is coming from the authorial voice. But there are definitely things in here that could be offensive. There's also a whole lot of trigger warnings and content warnings for this. So if you want to check out my review, I put a lot of those in there. But there is a lot of explicit addiction, drug use, alcohol use, um, violence, murder, stealing, parental abuse. There's just suicide. There's like, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of content in here to be aware of. 
That said, um, I kind of loved it. I completely understand why this is called a literary classic. I especially loved the ending and the last part of the book. It really, really resonated with me. This is a book that I could see myself actually revisiting and rereading. And it's a book that I think is gonna stay with me for a long time. Um, so while I think there are valid criticisms to be made here, and while I also think this is just not a book that everybody would enjoy, I really loved it. And even the parts of it that I didn't necessarily enjoy reading, coming to the end of it, I recognized that they were important to go through for the sake of character development and for getting where we end up. Um, so yeah, I do have an in-depth review of this if you want to hear more thoughts, but um, I loved it. I was actually surprised at how much it resonated with me especially towards the end of it. I think it has a lot to say about beauty and art and love and grief and toxic relationships and just so many things. I think it's a really, really rich book and pretty brilliantly written, but also really not the book for everyone. I also gave five stars to Shelter by Jung Yoon, and this is a book that you're gonna hear more about in another video, so I'm not gonna talk too much about it here, but this was a very, very pleasant surprise. It is a domestic literary thriller that deals with things like racial identity and family and abuse and cycles of abuse and uh, a lot of things. I really loved it really really loved it more than I think I expected to and would definitely recommend checking it out I do have an in-depth review on Goodreads but again because this is something I'm going to be talking about more in a different video I don't want to say too much here um but yeah this sucked me in and I could not put it down basically uh yeah lots of content warnings though so check that out my next five star read is one that honestly surprised me um, I did not expect to love this as much as I did. It's a few years old. This is a very hyped book, especially on booktube, and I didn't necessarily think I would love it. I, yeah, um, but I did. So this is Caraval by Stephanie Garber. So for some reason I thought that this was like a carnival book, and it's really not. Um, I listened to this on audio. I thought the audiobook was fantastic, and this was just a whole lot of fun. This is definitely the kind of thing I like from my YA fantasy. It's kind of dark. It involves a magical game where you don't know what's real or who to trust or if you can even trust your own emotions. It also involves a sibling relationship where a girl is trying to save her sister. It has a forbidden romance. It has lots of twists and turns. It's got really vivid, lush descriptions and poetic language. And I just like devoured this book and can't wait to jump into book two. I love this world so much and I was surprised at how into this I was. It's definitely kind of dark, a little bit soapy, um, but it was so fun and so interesting. So I ended up giving it five stars. Color me surprised. Honestly, I didn't expect to enjoy this as much as I did, but yeah, I'm a fan. So I will be moving on and probably will be listening to book two in December. So look forward to that. I also gave five stars to a book that was sent to me for review. This is The Caged Queen by Kristen Ciccarelli. This was kind of another pleasant surprise. This is the second book in a trilogy of companion novels set in the same YA fantasy world with plots that somewhat link together but each follow a different character. The first book was The Last Namsara, which I read a couple years ago and liked and was interested enough to want to read on when I was offered the last two books in the series, but I didn't expect to enjoy this one as much as I did. I will say The Caged Queen is much more a fantasy romance than the first book is. I also felt like for me it was just much better executed than The Last Namsara. I thought this was really, really good. I gave it five stars. I think that if you like fantasy romance, this is worth picking up. It involves a royal marriage of convenience and a love triangle. A girl marries her childhood friend, who is also the new king in this country, in order to try to save her people from starving and in so doing abandons the boy that she's been in love with and there's lots of political intrigue there is some violence in here there's also a strong sibling relationship if you're looking for that it deals a lot with grief her sister died when she was pretty young and then came back as this bird who stays with her and it's it some of the 
Other themes of this book are about grief and loss and learning to let go, and I just thought it was really, really great and beautifully done, so I would definitely recommend it if that sounds up your alley. All right, so there were two more books that I gave five stars to. The first one is another book that was sent to me for review, this one by Penguin Teen. This is A River of Royal Blood by Amanda Joy. So I was really thrilled when they reached out to me and offered to send me a finished copy because this was something that I was already excited to read. I follow the author on Instagram and this sounded right up my alley. It is a North African inspired debut YA fantasy story and um, this was just like so much fun. I had such a good time with this book and it is basically everything that I want from my YA fantasy. It was very engaging and fun and easy to read. It follows a girl who is a princess who was born with a rare and dangerous magic of marrow and blood and this world is a queendom but queens are not born. They earn the right to the throne. If there are sisters who are rival heirs, they have to fight to the death once they're of age in order to determine who gets the throne. And so Eva is coming up on her 17th birthday when she will officially be of age for her older sister to challenge her. And she has some really complicated family relationships. She's got kind of an estranged relationship from her mother. Her parents are separated. Her older sister, they used to be really close when they were kids and now they're not anymore. And her sister is kind of her mom's favorite and she's kind of her dad's favorite. And this is quite a dark and brutal world. There is a lot of violence. She is not afraid to kill off characters and the stakes are really high, which I kind of love because sometimes YA authors will kind of pull their punches on that and she definitely doesn't. There is a bit of a forbidden romance in it, although that never really takes center stage, but I enjoyed it. I liked the development of it. And I just loved Eva as a main character. I thought her story was really interesting. This had a lot of twists and turns. It had a really rich mythology and magic system. The world was really great. It's kind of casually diverse, which is nice. Um, people have different skin colors and different sexual orientations and it's just kind of casual it's not a huge deal the place that it does deal with systemic oppression is in the way that they handle a different people group and it doesn't really have to do with skin color but that is a theme that you do see here among others but also it's just a really good story and really fun and i'm so excited to read book two so um yeah definitely recommend checking this one out. I think she is one to watch and I will for sure be picking up the second book. Very, very excited about that one. And the final book that I gave five stars to is also my very first 2020 book that I have read. This one was requested by one of my patrons. Every month my patrons are entered into a raffle and one of them gets to select a book that they want to see me read and review. And so for November, the book that was requested was The Kingdom of Back by Marie Lu. This book is coming out in March of next year through Penguin Teen and it is a historical fiction book with elements of fantasy and magical realism. And obviously I gave it five stars. I really, really loved it. In general, I like Marie Lu a lot. I have loved most of her writing. It really works for me. This one is super interesting because it is quite different from anything she has published so far, but also in some ways it definitely feels like her. And this is also the first book that she wrote and sold. It just kind of never found a home before now. And so I'm really glad that this is now going to be out in the world. Like I said, this is historical fiction. It follows the story of Mozart's sister, who most people didn't know existed. Apparently she was also a musical prodigy and someone that Mozart looked up to quite a lot. And this entire book is told from her perspective. Part of the inspiration for this is that we know that when they were children and on the road to go on tour a lot because they toured together as children, Wolfgang Mozart and his sister Nanurl, which was her childhood nickname, made up this magical alternate place called the Kingdom of Back. And so Marie Lu kind of took some of that and then imagined what if it was a real place. So there is this fairy prince and this magical alternate world, but the reason that I would call this magical realism is that the story is really very much grounded in 
the historical fiction aspect of it and the primary relationship in this book is really the sibling relationship um, and I just think it is so brilliantly done. It does such a good job of unpacking the way that sibling relationships can sometimes be really complicated with deep deep love but sometimes also can be complicated with resentment or jealousy especially in situations where one sibling is being preferred over the other and in this case it's for gendered reasons and sexist reasons based on the way that the world was set up during this time period. Um, but there's also this deep love and this strong relationship throughout all of it. And it's really, really beautiful. I think the sibling relationship in here is so well done. I also think the way that the Kingdom of Back and the magic in this is done is really interesting because it often mirrors things that are happening in the real world. And so that's why I would call it, again, more magical realism. You're not spending most of your time in this alternate world. That is in some ways a parallel to the real world and the dangers and the perils of life during this time period with things like smallpox and infectious disease and you know lack of vaccinations and the ways that those types of things could really devastate people and poverty and um, parental abuse in ways that are a little bit less obvious. Um, so I really really loved this. I think it is beautifully told. It's angering, it's inspiring, it's touching and yeah i i love this i think that this is going to be a huge hit next year i would highly recommend checking it out um this is definitely one that i would consider purchasing a finished copy of also the cover i mean like let's just appreciate it. the cover is absolutely stunning but yeah the kingdom of back was really really great i i knew that i would probably enjoy it because i generally enjoy marie lulu's writing but I think this has a lot going for it and I think a lot of people are going to love it. So yeah, five stars for this one. And the final book that I read in November is the one book that got six stars and this is a new all-time favorite for me and is one that I actually have an individual video review for if you want to check that out, which I will link up above. This is The Starless Sea by Erin Morgenstern. I was surprised at how much I loved this and while I know this is definitely not going to be the right book for everyone, see that review video if you want to hear more, I felt like this was kind of my perfect book. Um, I'm obsessed. I do hope to reread it, maybe via audiobook in December if I can find the time, but I loved it. New all-time fave, guys. It was amazing. So yeah, really, really happy to find a new favorite book this month. So there you have it. Those are the 24 books that I read in November. In general, it was a really, really great reading month. And I feel like the second half of the month, as you can see, I had a lot of great books. I was just feel like I was giving five stars to so many things, but they were well deserved. Um, really, really awesome. So I'm hoping that the final month of the year finishes out just as strong and I read a lot of really great stuff. Um, talk to me in the comments down below. Let me know any of your thoughts or feelings on any of the books that I talked about. And for your question of the day, let me know what is your favorite genre or your most read genre? What do you gravitate towards the most? Obviously, as you can see, fantasy is clearly my favorite. It is what I gravitate towards most often and really love, even though I like reading a lot of other things as well. Let me know in the comments down below what your favorite genre is. If you guys like this video, give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you want to see more. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.